This is 1968, the movies. As Hollywood prepared for the crowning event of the 1968 awards season, the Oscars, tragedy struck the nation. On April 4th, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and the Academy Awards, scheduled for April 8th, were delayed until after his funeral. King's murder was just one of the tumultuous occurrences that year, which rocked the country and Tinseltown. Cultural shifts that accompanied the swinging 60s had already started to take hold, and nowhere was that transformation more visible than in the movies of 1968. It's reasonable to say that 1968 was the year that the movie business met the future and blinked. What really became apparent by 1968 was that the old Hollywood and the new Hollywood were clashing like tectonic plates about to have an earthquake. It was a clash between the major studios, which had dominated the industry for decades, and a new generation of filmmakers for a new generation of moviegoers. The insurrections on the campus and the turmoil in the streets and the sexual permissiveness and the Vietnam War and all the things that were colliding to revise the mores and the customs of our society. When Jack Valenti became president of the Motion Picture Association of America in 1966, he overhauled the decades-old production code strict moral guidelines that movies had to adhere to in order for the studios to be allowed to release them. I realized that we had to do something because creative people were straining at the bonds which had embraced them. That gave way to a new freedom as to what could be shown on screen. By 1968, some of the biggest hits became nothing short of revolutionary. There was Mike Nichols' directorial debut, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in 1966? For the first time, a major film company, Warner Brothers, was releasing a film in which profanity and what we would call in those days vulgar expressions were used on the screen. That had never happened before. It became one of the top grossing movies of the year, going on to garner 13 Oscar nods in 1967, winning five. Also in 1966, MGM had released Italian director Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up, his first film in English, about the exploits of a London fashion photographer starring David Hemmings. In one scene, Hemmings has two little teeny boppers and he takes their clothes off and they romp around a room. It was rather innocent stuff today, but it was mind shattering in, uh, in 1966. It too had been a remarkable critical and commercial success. Then came Nichols' next film, The Graduate. You're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman plays Benjamin Braddock, an aimless college grad who has an affair with an older woman, played by Anne Bancroft, and then falls in love with her daughter Elaine, played by Catherine Ross. He was rebelling against his upper-class parents who lived in the suburbs of Los Angeles, and all the advice he, he got about his future was that the future was plastics. The Graduate became the highest grossing film of 1967 and received seven Oscar nominations, winning Nichols the Academy Award for Best Director. But perhaps the biggest watershed film had been Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde. Based on the Depression-era gangsters Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, the screenplay was written by newcomers Robert Benton and David Newman, who, like many of their contemporaries, were heavily influenced by the new wave films coming out of Europe. Bonnie and Clyde, released by Warner Brothers, raked in some $70 million and was nominated for 10 Oscars. I think it was, a, it was The Outsiders Making Good. Um, in terms of theme. I think it's broke new ground in terms of the violence and the, and the combination of the violence with the, um, the sort of vulnerability of the characters. 
In the wake of Bonnie and Clyde, it was clear there was a massive appetite for similar fare, and Hollywood began to open its doors and checkbooks to newcomers. It had not been since the early moments of silent films that the studio system was willing to let very young men and women direct, write, and produce films. Among them, a 28-year-old Francis Ford Coppola, who directed Finian's Rainbow. Finian's Rainbow is difficult to describe because it's a mixture of sort of a fantasy and very real, you know, the racial uh, part of it. So it, it's not an easy story to to describe and not an easy story to put on the screen, frankly. But Francis Ford Coppola finished the film and it was nominated for several Academy and Golden Globe Awards. Meanwhile, at Warner Brothers, Richard Lester, who had worked with the Beatles, directed Julia, an uncommon movie. Petulia was selected to compete at that year's Cannes Film Festival. Over at United Artists, there was Canadian filmmaker George Dunning's 1968 film, Yellow Submarine, which uses the Beatles' music to drive the plot. It was surreal, it was psychedelic, it was candy-colored, it was everything, it was irrational. It had a storyline, but nobody really cared about the storyline. It was visually inventive in ways that influenced lots of TV shows and filmmakers who used animation for many years to come. Also, it was the beginning of the early examinations of the gay, lesbian movement. It was the very first time movies, mainstream movies, started dealing with that issue. After all this change, change in content, change in language. By November 1968, the production code that Jack Valenti had started to change was officially scrapped. A new era was already much in swing. Hollywood had to adapt. As popular culture shifts, Hollywood chases along behind it, like a guy trying to catch a streetcar. Between 1968 and 69, that streetcar was caught by most of the studios. Coming up, independent filmmakers steal the limelight when our look at the movies of 1968 continues. We've just finished making a movie dealing with the most talked about subject of the day, LSD. While the studios were busy catching up to popular culture, several independent filmmakers were already on top of it. The trip was radical. I used the LSD experience partially because I felt it was very cinematic and was part of what was going on, but also it was a way to comment on society in general. It was a real rebellion going on at that time. And the trip became one of the most successful films directed by Corman and released by his longtime collaborator, American International Pictures, founded by business partners Samuel Arkoff and James Nicholson. I'd made several pictures for major studios, and by and large, everything was fine, but several decisions were made by executives that I disagreed with, and I simply felt I wanted to make my own films. Corman was known as the king of B-films, having cornered the market on exploitation flicks, sci-fi films, and horror movies in the 50s before turning to social commentary. In 1966, Corman had made The Wild Angels. It's a rebellion, really, of working-class youth, and it's a comment on our society and a comment on the class system. Yeah, we don't want nobody telling us what to do. The film made Peter Fonda an anti-establishment icon. Wild Angels had not only been wildly successful, but had also launched an entirely new genre, the outlaw biker film. At the same time, actor John Cassavetes was pioneering the use of cinema verite, 
making films he financed through his acting work. Cassavetes actually had come to hate Hollywood. He was determined to make movies on his own terms. In 1968, Cassavetes wrote and directed the landmark film Faces. The movie depicts the final stages of a disintegrating middle-class marriage. It was very radical because he was looking at the way many Americans live their lives. It wasn't an obvious social subject. Faces was a critical and commercial success. Faces was a very honest, very hard-hitting, soul-searching picture. And I think uh, people were, a lot of directors were influenced by that. It was as if European cinema had found a place to land in the United States. He made a series of those. They were all made for under $500,000. Bogdanovich himself made a film called Targets in 1968. He had worked as a production assistant on Corman's Wild Angels, and following its success, Corman had offered him the chance to direct his own film. Targets intertwines the stories of an aging horror movie star with that of a Vietnam vet who suddenly goes on a killing spree. It was a sort of social commentary, yes, because we were saying that Victorian horror was outdated by modern horror. Bogdanovich went on to make the Oscar-nominated classic The Last Picture Show, a stark coming-of-age drama set in Texas in 1971. It was very honest, and we said, let's not be cute or afraid to show the sexuality the way it really is or was. A young Brian De Palma was also getting his start in New York. Influenced by a 1966 Jean-Luc Godard film about young people and their concerns, he and his producing partner wrote what would become Greetings, about three aimless friends trying to dodge the draft. It starred Robert De Niro in his feature film debut. Like as not, she may turn off the light before undressing. It was the first film to receive an X rating from the MPAA, although it was later given an R. Greetings raked in more than a million dollars at the box office, leading De Palma to make a sequel, also starring De Niro. This kind of started the career of Brian De Palma, who went on to make some really fabulous films. Meanwhile, Dennis Hopper directed perhaps the most groundbreaking independent film of the time, the antithesis of the violent biker gang movie, Easy Rider. It's not a hundred motorcyclists from the Hells Angels going to a funeral. It's two guys, it's like John Wayne and John Agar cutting across the West looking for Natalie. Natalie Wood, it's us looking for America's two guys. And the, the motorcycles are the horses. No, it's not a motorcycle movie, it's a Western. The movie was filmed between February and June of 1968 on location in the South. It stars Fonda and Hopper as Wyatt and Billy two bikers who score a lot of money in a drug deal in L.A. and decide to travel cross-country to reach New Orleans in time for Mardi Gras. It's the story of a man who went looking for America and couldn't find it anywhere. Along the way, Wyatt and Billy befriend an alcoholic lawyer, George Hansen, played by newcomer Jack Nicholson. Oh, I've got a helmet. Who then joins them on their journey. Born to be wild. The movie was one of the first to integrate found music, featuring the band, the birds, the Jimi Hendrix experience, and Steppenwolf. This is grass. And it was the first film to use real drugs on screen. You mean marijuana? Yeah. <laughs> yes, and they were real joints, and I was making one paper zigzag rolls, which I was proud to be doing on film, so you could see that I was, knew what I was up to. Easy Rider was a mega hit, grossing $60 million in 1969 against a budget of less than 400000 When Easy Rider in 69 comes along, changes the game. As things like Easy Rider begin to make money, suddenly every studio, by 1969, every studio created a so-called youth unit. Designed to make new Hollywood films that would appeal to the baby boomer generation. Coming up, 
Old Hollywood goes out with a bang when our look at the movies of 1968 continues. Well, old Hollywood wisdom would say, if it was a big Broadway hit, you should make a film out of it. And that's true, you know, those films did well, but they were quickly being supplanted. By 1968, only five Broadway winners made the cut and were adapted for the silver screen. The first was Gene Sachs' The Odd Couple, starring Jack Lemmon as neurotic neat freak Felix Unger and Walter Matthau as fun-loving slob Oscar Madison. They're together, bringing to all America the laughter of Neil Simon's Broadway smash hit. The Odd Couple is based on the true incident in my brother's life, Danny, and uh, an agent friend of his, Roy Gerber, both of whom were divorced and decided to move in together to uh, save costs because they both had to pay alimony to their wives. I have no compunctions whatsoever in, in saying that this is one of the best comedy scripts ever. <laughs> Stop that, will you? What are you doing? I'm trying to clear up my ears. <laughs> It appealed to lots of audiences. So it was a standard comedy, but it was done so well with the acting that uh, it was very popular. Who wants food? Walter Matthau reprised his role from Broadway. He's brilliant. It's brilliantly cast. It's pure entertainment. It's a straightforward comedy. It doesn't pretend to be anything else. But what it does, it does so well. I still laugh at that movie. Hello, gorgeous. Then there's Funny Girl, with Barbara Streisand reprising her Broadway role as real-life comedian, singer, and actress Fanny Bryce. You mean I'm hired? I'm a Ziffo girl. That's exactly what you are. It was Barbara Streisand's first film, and so she she's just kind of captivated America in Funny Girl. It was also one of Ben-Hur director William Wyler's final films. And that was also one of the last really successful big Hollywood musicals. Funny Girl was nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture, but lost to Carol Reed's Oliver. Please, sir, I want some more. It was the tail end of big budget musicals that did well. It had uh, Broadway roots and it was a cute story about an orphan in uh, London. The drama, the music, the, the dancing, the, everything fits so perfectly. And who made it that way? Sir Carol Reed. Who won the Academy Award for Best Director in 1969. Oliver. Surprisingly, it did win the Best Picture. A lot of people now think it's one of the worst Oscar decisions of all time, but at the moment, at that time, it was considered a very, very solid choice. Another Academy Award nominee for Best Picture, The Lion in Winter, directed by prominent British filmmaker Anthony Harvey. That's classic Hollywood thinking in that it's based on a Broadway prestige, Broadway title. It's a historical drama set in 12th century England. Peter O'Toole playing Henry II. Oh, God, but I do love being king. Catherine Hepburn playing Eleanor of Aquitaine. How dare of you to let me out of jail. It's only for the holidays. Very good supporting cast, Anthony Hopkins. This is classic Hollywood product. Yet it was also forward thinking in the way the characters interacted. It's, it's a much funnier film than people realize, and I think that its reputation suggests. And that kind of comic tone really points to Hollywood's near future. When you look at the tone of William Goldman's Oscar winning script for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids, which was all impudent, wisecracking comedy, and then a little bit of sobering drama right at the end. That was a new formula for Hollywood, and it was, and it started, I think, with The Lion in the Winter. Italian director Franco Zeffirelli's version of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet also offered a fresh take on a Hollywood classic. I don't want to do what was done on stage at the time of the original creation. I want to investigate and question the mind and the fantasy and the spirit of the author. Wherefore, 
Which is why he cast young unknown actors Olivia Hussey and Leonard Whiting in the leading roles. For the first time, he cast two teenagers that were close to the age of Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet has been filmed many, many times, but always with older male and female stars as the two leads. And when you compare Zeffirelli's version with those other older versions, it's, it's just so much better. It's not as conventional. It even included a uh, post-wedding honeymoon scene with the two actors in bed together, which had never been seen in a Shakespeare play before on screen. He said, you know what? I want to make a passionate film that's a classic that teenagers in 50 years will sit and watch it and feel the same passion and the same love that the teenagers of today will feel. He did it. I get so many messages of people saying it was a horrible time in my life. I was a teenager and I was awkward. Or I was in my 20s and I just really wanted to end my life. And, and I saw this film and it changed. I saw you and I saw Leonard and I believed again in love. But in the struggle between the old and the new Hollywood, even Shakespeare would be challenged. 68 was a year when the balance between the old product and the new product was firmly established. By 69, the new product had won the war. Coming up, science fiction reaches new heights when our look at the movies of 1968 continues. As Hollywood was bidding farewell to what had once been standard fare in movie making, it was witnessing unprecedented innovation and experimentation in genres from science fiction and horror to action films and westerns. When Stanley Kubrick made his 1968 masterpiece, 2001, A Space Odyssey, not a great deal of legitimacy had been given to science fiction films, which were often cheap B-movies. When Kubrick conceived of the movie, he changed the industry. It was the age of space exploration, and he had long been interested in the idea of extraterrestrial life on other planets. So in 1964, he had contacted acclaimed science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. What he said is when he approached Arthur C. Clarke is that uh, he'd like to engage him in, in making the proverbial really good science fiction film, which to, to Kubrick's mind had never been made. Clarke agreed to collaborate and they used his short story The Sentinel as a way to begin the project. He had in mind right from the start doing something on a grand scale hence the name 2001 a space odyssey he wanted something that would resonate with the ancient greek epics like the odyssey it took kubrick four years and roughly 10 million dollars to make his film by the time he finished it he realized that he wanted to make a movie that just really worked on an almost purely visual level he and arthur c clark had written a lot of narration that explained a lot of what was going on in the film he ended up scrapping all that he ended up making a film that really required audiences to work the movie plays out through a series of vignettes, spanning millions of years of human evolution. It poses no less a question than, how did we become human? And what is our destiny? The one constant, the repeat appearances of mysterious monoliths. It's the alien, and that monolith affects the course of human development and human civilization. Kubrick also addresses the impact of technology on humankind. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Hal 9000, the computer, was uh, completely revolutionary because uh, there had never been a, a malevolent computer character in mainstream science fiction. Hal enables us to do things. Uh, Hal looks after us. Uh, but it's also a warning. Uh, if you get too comfortable with that situation, what might be the end result? Kubrick is perhaps suggesting that the final evolutionary leap is one that moves beyond the realm of technology. 
one of the reasons it's still so vital and still astounding is that it's mysterious and it draws you in and it doesn't connect all the dots for you. It was a cerebral approach to sci-fi cinema, a far cry from the straightforward adventure stories that had come before it. It's a film that really took the genre of science fiction much further into something more philosophical. It's also one of those films that simply says, special effects are us. The special effects in 2001 were stunning then and they are impressive today. And that is saying something considering 50 years of advancements in digital technology and, and effects work of all kinds. And that film still looks distinct and singular and, and wondrous, I think. And it sounded phenomenal as well. Just showing the majesty of space accompanied by uh, Strauss waltz music. Uh, never been seen before. Something like the Blue Danube uh, suggests a kind of harmony of the spheres, a way in which things all come into balance. Whereas the other is that sense of epic discovery, epic recognition, epic accomplishment. Kubrick's dedication to sight and sound is equally matched by his attention to scientific accuracy. He employed uh, all kinds of futurists and designers. He collaborated with a lot of companies from you know, IBM, getting their ideas about how a computer might work and what it might look like in 2001. And it was so realistic and it was so prescient about what was going to be happening in space travel and exploration in future years. 2001 was the top grossing film at the U.S. box office in 1968, raking in more than $56 million. 2001, a space officer, Stanley Kubrick. And it won an Oscar for special visual effects. I don't think that there's been a film about space travel made in the past 50 years that does not in some way quote 2001 A Space Odyssey. 2001, however, was not the only trailblazing sci-fi film in 1968. Planet of the Apes, beyond your wildest dream. Planet of the Apes was kind of an antidote to 2001, but it was really a wonderful idea. A civilization where humans run wild in the jungles, and the superior beings are apes. It was an adventure story, a science fiction story, but it used that format to pose really pointed questions about assumptions that we make as a society. The movie was based on a 1963 novel by French writer Pierre Boulle. Producer Arthur Jacobs had bought the rights to the book, and Rod Serling, of the Twilight Zone fame, wrote the original screenplay. Franklin J. Schaffner, known for his screen epics, directed the final adaptation, which starred Charlton Heston as astronaut George Taylor. Hundreds of technicians and the largest number of makeup artists ever assembled assisted the producers, the writers, the director, and the cast. A cast that includes Maurice Evans, Brady McDowell, and Kim Hunter. I love the character of Dr. Zero and all of that, but I said to, to my agent, um, however, they, they seem to be real apes. How are we gonna deal with that? <laughs> you know? He said, oh, don't worry, 20th Century Fox knows how to do things like that. Indeed it did. The movie was groundbreaking for its prosthetic makeup techniques, created by expert artist John Chambers, who won an honorary Academy Award for his work on the film. It was really well done because it was so realistic you could really enter into the picture and understand that these apes were who they were. They weren't just costumed human beings. When the protagonist finally escapes, he discovers, to his dismay, where he really is. Oh my God, I'm back. You have this fantastic twist ending where you find out that you're not on another planet, you're actually on Earth after the apes have taken over and uh, in that regard, the film is a great cautionary tale about where we're going and if we don't stop our warring ways, what's going to happen. It was a new kind of film. And of course, then when they opened it, it was just a huge smash. And I 
drove by opening night, and there were lines around the block. So I thought, okay, we're, we're home. They turned out to be one of the biggest grossing pictures Fox ever made. Planet of the Apes and 2001 posed questions that real-world events were conjuring up as well in 1968. Both films were released within days of two of the most shocking events of the year. The announcement by President Lyndon Johnson that he would not seek re-election and the assassination of civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as the news unfolded, the nation asked itself, how did we get here? And where are we headed? Both on and off screen, the answers were few and far between. Coming up, directors up the ante in horror films when our look back at the movies of 1968 continues. They're coming to get you, Barbara. They're coming for you, Barbara. Stop it! You're acting like a child! They're coming for you! Look! There comes one of them now! And so begins more than 90 minutes of sheer terror. No! No! Unlike earlier gothic-like films, Night of the Living Dead brought horror directly into everyday life. Audiences who went to see Night of the Living Dead and not really knowing what they were going to be experiencing came out of that thing I think utterly changed. They were they were freaked out. George Romero and John Russo were award-winning commercial filmmakers when they decided to try their hand at making a low-budget horror movie. The audience for horror will always come out, and because that audience seems to be there, we were able to raise the money to do Night of the Living Dead as a small independent film, never expecting that it would turn out to be Night of the Living Dead. Romero wrote what became the opening sequence and Russo used that to write the rest. We kind of blended the vampire myth with the zombie mythology and came up with something that people find far more frightening. And that became a flesh-eating zombie. They shot the movie in a rural area outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, using unknown actors and locals. Barbara flees to a nearby farmhouse, where she takes refuge with six other characters. The wave of murder which is sweeping the eastern third of the nation is being committed by creatures who feast upon the flesh of their victims. I mean, within these small rooms and limited spaces, the shadows speak volumes about how the choices for these characters are growing more and more limited and things are more challenging by the second. There's this slow march of the zombies on the farmhouse that just is relentless. And one by one, every one of these people are picked off and they die. All except Ben, the movie's protagonist, who survives the night in the cellar and is close to being rescued when he's mistaken for a zombie and shot dead. The humans in Night of the Living Dead uh, argue about whether it's safer in the basement or upstairs or in the bedroom and silly things that really don't have anything to do with the problem, which seems to be what mankind does a lot. And uh, in the meantime, the problem just comes in the back door and swallows them all up. And, and humanity itself winds up killing the hero. There had never been anything on screen as raw or as visceral and the movie was a major hit. Night of the Living Dead was one of the most successful low-budget pictures of that era. It cost just slightly over $100,000 to make, and it made $30 million. Hollywood wakes up, right? They notice this. Ah, low-budget picture, huge profits. You know, can we learn something from this? And what can we learn from the extreme gore and really, really grueling carnage and fright and horror this movie's dishing out? On the other end of the horror spectrum in 1968 was Rosemary's Baby, based on the chilling 1967 novel by Ira Levin, which had become an instant bestseller. The movie was directed by Polish-French director Roman Polanski, who was brought to Hollywood by Paramount president Robert Evans. Bob Evans, who was an actor turned studio executive, talked his way into getting Rosemary's made with Roman directing. And that 
sort of elevated and changed the trajectory of the horror film in the U.S. for a long, long time. It turned out to be a very smart version of a film about paranoia and about gaslighting and about issues that people saw culturally in 1968. Oh, please, let's take it. It starts when newlyweds Rosemary and Guy Woodhouse meet their new neighbors, who are, in fact, part of a satanic cult. Rosemary's husband was an aspiring actor who was not having any luck. And so, supposedly, he made a deal to get some acting jobs, but then sold Rosemary to the devil neighbors. Rosemary later finds out she is pregnant and thus begins her nightmare. Dr. Hill, there's a plot. The way the events unfold, he doesn't ratchet up the atmospherics or things like that. He follows the characters and, and the story of this woman who deeply suspects that something horrible is going on. He just does it in a, a straightforward way and that, that certainly increases the fear factor all the way until the bitter end when Rosemary learns the truth about her baby. What have you done to it? What have you done to its eyes? The movie just works on every level. You are tense. You, it's a knuckle biter. You know, you don't know how it's going to end and it doesn't end exactly the way you think it is. It's one of those great movies with a twist ending. Aren't you his mother? And Rosemary, in the final scene, accepts that she is. You walk into the theater thinking that this couldn't happen, and you leave the theater a little scared in a way that this could be real, that it could be this kind of a cult. Nobody expected Rosemary's Baby to be the kind of hit it was. Both commercially and critically, nominated for several Academy, Golden Globe, and other awards. I think the great success of Rosemary's Baby is Polanski tiptoeing up to showing you the worst, but never quite doing it. It's a really sick, black joke of a horror film. Meantime, you have George Romero and Night of the Living Dead showing you more than you ever thought would be possible in terms of gore. So you have almost unlimited possibility in what the screen can do. Indeed, both films were seminal to the genre spawning a myriad of sequels and spin-offs that built on that sense of unlimited possibility. Coming up, action films and westerns receive a makeover when our look back at the movies of 1968 continues. You can't talk about 1968 without looking at Steve McQueen and his two big successes that year, The Thomas Crown Affair and Bullet. For Bullet alone, that car chase over the hills and all around San Francisco, really, really for the time, groundbreaking, is such a grabber, and people couldn't stop talking about that car chase. Bullet was British director Peter Yates's first Hollywood movie and its car chase scene revolutionized industry standards for action films. The film exploited action in a way that was much more tactile and real and explosive than films had been doing. McQueen stars as Frank Bullitt, a veteran San Francisco cop. After a mafia witness under his protection gets murdered, he goes after the hitman. Bullet finds them while out driving his now iconic Ford Mustang GT Fastback and thus begins the legendary 10-minute high-speed chase through the steep streets of San Francisco's Russian Hill with Bullet hot on the heels of the men in the Dodge Charger. In some ways now it, it's, it's even more impressive because it's all real cars and real stunts. There's no CGI work, it's just this incredible camera work. Not surprisingly, it won the 1969 Academy Award for Best Film Editing and was nominated for and won several other critical awards. Bullet was also a commercial success, the fifth highest grossing movie of the year. The money rolled in for Ford Motors too, as Mustang sales went through the roof. As the president of the Ford Motor Company once wrote me, I have written the greatest car commercial in history. They're still making bullets, and they'll continue to make bullets. 
It didn't hurt, of course, that McQueen was in the driver's seat. McQueen was just insanely sexy. And so, you know, we were just beginning to develop a new crop of leading men. The Redfords and the Paul Newmans and the McQueens were just coming into their own by 68. And McQueen certainly had that ineffable anti-hero sneer at polite society. He used it to full effect in a more subtle way in his other 1968 film, Norman Jewison's The Thomas Crown Affair, in which he plays a billionaire who orchestrates elaborate bank heists for fun. It was about a guy uh, who was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Dartmouth, uh, lived in Boston. He was attacking the establishment. Faye Dunaway plays the insurance investigator trying to catch him. It was a cat and mouse game between Vicky, the Faye Dunaway character, and the Steve McQueen character. The most famous scene, of course, was the chess match. She checkmates him during the game, but then he said, well, let's play a different game, and they kiss, and then the, the scene fades. But the question was, was she really bringing him to justice, or was she falling for his romantic advances? In the end, he outsmarts her. The Thomas Crown Affair was the first Hollywood feature film where the hero commits a major crime and gets away with it. I remember we were worried that somebody was going to make trouble for us, but nobody seemed to notice at the time. The Thomas Crown Affair was also one of the first feature films to use split-screen techniques to show simultaneous events. It did moderately well at the box office, and reviews at the time were mixed, but Run like a circle in a spiral. It did win the Oscar for Best Original Song for Windmills of Your Mind. While Steve McQueen was busy breathing fresh air into action films, Clint Eastwood was making waves of his own, revitalizing the Western. Eastwood starred in 1968's Hang 'em High, directed by Ted Post. Hang 'em. It was one of the first so called revisionist westerns, which depict a morally ambiguous world where heroes can be outlaws and outlaws become heroes. Hang 'em High was a huge hit, the biggest United Artists opening in history. The railroad, the boom towns. A new life and the promised land. Then there was Sergio Leone's 1968 epic, Once Upon a Time in the West, an Americanized spaghetti western. What makes it so extraordinary is that it took the whole mythology of the West, the very clear morality of westerns, and it upended it because the central character is the villain. And on top of that, he's played by Henry Fonda, who's an icon of American integrity. It gave the audience almost no clear rooting interests. It didn't have the usual, uh, very identifiably good or evil archetypes. It was a, a film that was tailor-made for what was going on in the world in 1968 when so many of the old received notions of law and order were out the window. It's a Western in which chaos reigns, and chaos was reigning in 1968. Indeed, chaos reigned, forever altering the American landscape. As the movie industry rapidly adjusted to the changes taking place in the world around it, it continued to evolve, and the 70s ushered in an era of film that would further push the boundaries and break new ground. Movies like The Godfather and Dirty Harry, movies like Star Wars and Jaws, movies that would never have been made without the movies of 1968. As we leave, one last look back at those groundbreaking masters of cinema.